What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome into the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe below. Would greatly appreciate that. But we have a ton to get into today. It's a very busy time of year. We've got trades, we've got releases, we've got practice updates, we've got injuries, we've got return from injuries. There is so much to get into. So let's jump in right away. And I want to start with the Kamal Martin news because while there was a lot of news, I still feel like this was probably the biggest news of Monday. Of course, if you haven't heard, Kamal Martin has reportedly been released. And the reason I say that isn't because I don't believe the report. There have been multiple reports and it's been confirmed and Kamal Martin wasn't at practice on Monday. So certainly not uh, disputing the report in any way, shape or form. However, what is noteworthy here is that he wasn't actually released by the Packers yet. And why that's noteworthy is during this time of year, what you will see happen from time to time is the reports that a player was released. And then maybe some team that's really down on the waiver wire uh, chart or the, you know, whatever you want to call it at hierarchy, they might call and say, hey, we know we're not going to get this guy via waivers, but we'd like to bring him in. We'll offer you a contingent, you know, seventh round pick if he makes the team, which is obviously better than, you know, him just getting released and claimed by another team if you're the Packers. So they may still get a buyer on Kamal Martin. Do I think it's necessarily likely? No, but it is still possible. So maybe as you are listening to this, maybe there's been an update and uh, he has been traded instead of released. But either way, no matter what happens, he is not going to be a Green Bay Packer in 2020. 2021. And I do think this is somewhat of a surprise at this point in time. If you would have told me that Kamal Martin wasn't on the 53-man roster, it would have been noteworthy, but certainly not surprising. The writing was on the wall a little bit with the fact that he's been with the number three linebackers all during training camp. They tried him at a different position at outside linebacker. He's once again struggled with injuries. His play on the field was not good. Go out on Ben Fennell's Twitter and see some of the plays that he put on tape in this last preseason game. It was not pretty. All of that it just goes to say this shouldn't be ultra shocking, even if it's surprising in the fact that it came before even the 80-man roster cut, or during the 80-man roster cut down, if you will. Like the fact he didn't even make it to final cuts is a, a pretty decent you know, fall from where he was a season ago. If you remember last season, he was the rookie talk of training camp last year. More on that in just a moment. Looked like he was going to start week one, gets hurt, eventually ends up getting reps with the ones and, and getting some snaps in the middle of the season, kind of falls out of favor, kind of goes more to Chris Barnes and, and of course, uh, Christian Kirksey as he got healthier throughout the season. And then, you know, the expectation coming back was the hope that he was going to be able to make a jump in this offseason with a mini camp OTA, et cetera. And that just never presented itself. And before we get into that, I, I first of all want to, in a way, it, it's tough to give kudos to a GM, right? For, you know, sort of quote unquote, screwing up a pick, but then, you know, being man enough to, you know, learn from it and just move on. But we see so many times that teams hold on to these draft picks because they were draft picks and just not cut bait when it's time to cut bait. And I think on Monday, Brian Gutekind showed that, hey, you know, yes, we just drafted him in the fifth round a season ago. It didn't work out. We're moving on. And that is what it is, right? Like the, unless you're a top 100 pick or at least in the first four rounds, like even a fourth round pick, like they jettisoned Jamon Moore, you know, pretty quickly off the team, right? So like, unless you're a top 100 pick, like those protections don't mean a whole heck of a lot. The draft mostly and usually ends after pick 100. Now Green Bay has been better after that, but I still give credit for to Brian Gutekinds to, to, for saying, you know what, we, we drafted this guy in the fifth round. We really liked him, just hasn't worked out and we're moving on. Now, Let's go back to that training camp a season ago. Because you might say, Andy, listen, I heard so much about Kamal Martin in training camp a season ago. He was arguably the best rookie in training camp for the, for the people that were there. There were definitely flashes of him on tape a season ago. He's this athletic player. How does Ty Summers and Oren Burks and all these linebackers through the course of the year get chance after chance after chance? And meanwhile, Kamal Martin, who has all this athletic ability, is gone before even the 53-man roster cut in his second season. How does that possibly happen? Well, I want to go back to training camp a season ago, and I just want to give you an insight. So when you're hearing about players that are doing well or doing poorly, you have to remember, first of all, nobody that's on that sideline, there's everyone on that sideline knows a decent amount about football, right? None of us, myself included, are 
pure talent evaluators. I get to pretend from time to time, and I've certainly gone to a couple different scouting classes to kind of learn some of this stuff, and I definitely have watched a ton of tape and things like that, but none of us have been in the NFL scouting NFL talent. Furthermore, and maybe more importantly, is that while we're watching these players, there are 90 guys, or even if there's injuries, like 80 guys that are out on the field at one time. No no one person in the media that's watching these practices is just sitting for a day and be like, all right, today's the day I'm just going to watch Kamal Martin and I'm going to check every single box that he does. Or I'm not looking at you know Royce Newman and saying like, okay, I want to see what his pad level was like and how he you know used leverage on a specific play. And frankly, if anyone on the beat tweeted out like, all right, you know, Cody Capra had great leverage on that play against Kingsley Kiki, nobody cares, right? Everyone that's there is looking for splash plays, impact players, things that, you know, people are going to care about and want to hear because again, nobody on that sideline is a talent evaluator. And what happened a season ago with Kamal Martin is Kamal Martin made a variety of plays throughout training camp. There were multiple impact hits when they did those live periods. Like Kamal Martin hit some people. It looked good. He made impact plays, but nobody's watching him the next play to be like, all right, was he aligned correctly? Did he do this right? Did he drop back in space? Like, unless you're making those big plays, you're, you're probably not getting noticed all that much, especially as like a fifth round pick, you know, period. So what you're trying to do as a media member is to kind of piece that together. You're looking at, you're seeing these impact plays and you're like, man, Kamal Martin keeps showing up day after day. I see these impact plays. And meanwhile, the Packers continue to have him practice with the ones a ton. So you're trying, you're putting the you know, tea leaves together, right? You're doing the math. You're saying, all right, Packers are practicing them with the ones. Like he's shown up a ton, made a ton of plays. I'm going to go ahead and assume this he's probably pretty good. And either way, nobody's tweeting out like, hey, Kamal Martin's the next great inside linebacker. But yeah, everyone was pretty excited. I think rightfully so what Kamal Martin was doing in training camp a season ago with no preseason, no OTA, no mini camp, all of that. Now, that's why when I've been saying about Kylan Hill and all some of these other rookies who have looked good in camp, we don't crown them until we see them on Sundays. We're not making sweeping proclamations that the Packers have the best draft class in the league. <clears throat> we need to see what happens on Sundays. But what happened with Kamal Martin last year, you go and watch his tape. It is the literal definition of a chicken with his head cut off. He's running around a million miles per hour. He's getting in the back of the line of scrimmage. And to a casual observer, he looks like, hey, he's getting right in the thick of things. He's playing aggressive. He's playing fast. And for me, and just quickly, when I did my grades a season ago, for those of you who don't know, I grade every player and every play for, I think, five seasons it's been now, four or five seasons. And he was my lowest graded player on a per play basis. Not my lowest overall, because it's tough to do that when you don't play a ton of snaps, but my lowest graded player on the entire team on a per play basis. He was my lowest graded linebacker overall, period, despite how many snaps he played. And the reason for that is because he just, he wasn't disciplined at all. He was shooting the wrong gaps. He wasn't getting back in his right coverage responsibilities. It just, it like the game was just way too fast for him. And he was playing fast with it, but not doing the right things. And even where I struggled with it is for so long with AJ Hawk and with Blake Martinez and those sort of players, I sort of, you know, I was on the side, like a lot of people were of saying, hey, these guys aren't playing aggressive enough. Like I would like to see Blake Martinez, AJ Hawk be a bit more aggressive, a little bit more or a little, little bit less passive and go and shoot gaps and make plays. Part of that wasn't necessarily their job description, but I wanted to see more of it. So now all of a sudden you've got this young rookie linebacker who's shooting gaps and being more aggressive. And in a way I even felt like, okay, I guess I, I, like I can't speak out of the other way of my mouth and say like, all right, like I hear I've been asking for linebackers to play aggressive. Now he's doing it and like all these mistakes are happening, but there needs to be a middle ground, right? He was playing way too fast. There were times Martinez and Hawk were playing a bit too passive. Ideally, you want someone that's in the middle. I think Desmond Bishop is a great example of that. It's been a while since there's been a player like that, but somebody who's not afraid to go and fill a gap, make a hit, make a play, but somebody who knows the right time and place to do that. And Kamal Martin had the wrong side of it where he's way too aggressive and it became a problem. And watch again, go, go and look at the film that Ben Fennell placed from this last preseason game. It was not clicking. He was all over the place. He was going wrong gap, like just, just not knowing what he was supposed to do. So yes, it's, it's, it's been a disappointing fall for Kamal Martin, but 
once you realize that it's just, it's not clicking, it's not there, like the athleticism and that stuff doesn't matter. And if they've been trying to get through to him and it's not clicking, and I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, but if it's reached a point where, listen, you know, it didn't work at outside linebacker, it didn't work at inside linebacker, special teams isn't, a, you know, his, his forte. And like, if it's just not clicking, you move on. And I think that's ultimately what happened with Kamal Martin. Now, at that inside linebacker position, I do think, of course, Devondre Campbell and Chris Barnes are making it. I think Oren Burks is pretty close to a lock at this point with Kamal Martin being gone. I do think there is potentially one or two spots. And I think Ty Summers, Isaiah McDuffie, um, even Ray Wilborn, I think could get in that conversation as crazy as that may sound. There's always one player that comes out of nowhere. It wouldn't shock me if that was Wilborn. I know just yesterday I said it wouldn't surprise me if he was in the, the cut down this week at 80. I went back and watched some of his tape and it was much better than I thought. Plus he's been in a ton on special teams. So I still think those guys are at least in on the conversation, but we'll see what happens there. I, I think there's, I, I, outside of Burks, Campbell, and, and uh, Barnes, I don't think anything else is, is a complete lock and maybe even Burks isn't, but he's looked much better and is still a core special teams guy. I would give the nod to Summers, but I don't think that's a lead pipe lock quite yet, but still an interesting battle going on for those backup inside linebackers. All right, let's go to the other interesting news of the day. And of course, that was that Kadar Hallman was traded to the Texans for a seventh round pick. Now, immense kudos to Brian Gutekunst for getting a pick for Kadar Hallman. Not only a pick, but I would have bet anything that if they traded Kadar Hallman for a pick, it would have been conditional upon Kadar Hallman making the team. It was not. They got a pure seventh round pick that was through Chicago, who they, they got that pick in the Anthony Miller trade. So now, now they have Chicago's seventh round pick from next season, and it is not protected. It's not contingent. It is a pure pick. So even if Kadar Hallman gets released immediately, they still get that pick, which is incredible. So kudos to Brian Gutekunst, because listen, there was probably what one spot left for three players, Kadar Hallman, KB Anento, and Isaac Yadam. If you would have said, listen, who's making the team Isaac Yadam or Kadar Hallman, I would have said Yadam. If you would have said, hey, who's making the team Ento or Hallman, I would have said Ento. So like while it was down to three players, at the end of the day, it was really down to two for one spot. And Kadar was just behind the eight ball. So they were going to release. I'd be shocked if they weren't going to release him. So to get a seventh round pick in exchange for that, that's again, a guaranteed seventh round pick. That's a really great job by Brian Gutekunst. Kadar has been pretty solid on special teams. He was the number one punt gunner in uh, the first preseason game, which is why I was hesitant to say like he's gone, gone. But from a pure coverage standpoint, really struggled. Very Like you could tell like KB Nento just in camp has been so much better in coverage than Josh Jackson and, and Kadar Hallman were. And it wasn't particularly close. And even Isaac Yadam, who just got to camp, still to me looks better in coverage than either Jackson or Hallman did. The fact that they were able to trade Jax Jackson and Hallman for Yadam in a seventh round pick, I think is really good work for Brian Gutekunst. And listen, th those things ultimately probably don't mean a whole heck of a lot, but sometimes the difference in really good teams and not so great teams is just those margins, is getting players back or getting picks back for things that you were going to give away anyway. So I really like this by Brian Gutekunst. I thought it was a really smart trade. And hey, for Packer fans, now just another reason to to cheer against the Chicago Bears because the worse they do, the better that seventh round pick is. So uh, just another reason, not like you needed one, but another reason uh, to cheer against the Chicago Bears this upcoming season. Uh, let's see what else. Daniel Crawford was released. So that was at least somewhat noteworthy. Not a surprise there at all. The only thing that was surprising to me is there's a decent chance those top four tight ends don't play in the last preseason game, which I thought would have meant that, you know, probably Sternberger and, and Crawford and those guys, you know, needed to be active, but they must feel comfortable. Maybe Daphne's going to play this game or something, but they released Crawford before that last game. Um, we did see some new injuries in practice. Ty Summers and Will Redmond were not practicing. Also, Devin Funches, Chris Blair, uh, Vernon Scott, Zadarius Smith, uh, Kelly and Winfrey were all, Ryan Kelly and then uh, Juwan Winfrey were not practicing either. So those guys remained out. We did see two returns to practice. We saw Equinemia St. Brown and of course, Jordan Love return. So hopefully that's a good sign that Jordan Love may be able to play this upcoming weekend. That would be huge for him, huge for the Packers. And, you know, really... It, you know, one that maybe could 
if they feel comfortable with it, that could spell the release of Dolagala, you know, earlier and, and potentially be able to make a move there. Um, I, I don't think they'll do that. I think they'll be a little bit cautious just in case Love can't go. But um, either way, you'd love to see him out on the field. He did not participate in team activities. So something he probably is going to have to do before he gets cleared for Saturday, but a good first start to begin the week. Um, another noteworthy move is that Royce Newman was actually practicing at left guard on Monday with Lucas Patrick at right guard. So that's a little bit interesting. Uh, Newman had been at right guard since he got into the conversation. I thought he had a really good game this last Saturday. So I'm a little bit surprised as a rookie, they're kind of switching him around a little bit. Now, going back to last season, Lucas Patrick much better at right guard than he was at left guard. So if they've kind of come to the conclusion that Lucas Patrick and Royce Newman are going to be the starters, and I'm not saying that's the conclusion that they've come to, but if it is, maybe they're saying, hey, Lucas is just so much better at right guard. We're at least going to see what happens with Royce at left guard, and maybe he's the same at left as he is at right, which then makes that decision easier. Again, overall, I'm a little surprised after he played well at right guard that with a rookie, you're kind of making that move at this point, but he did practice at left guard in mini camps and OTAs as well. So it's not completely foreign to him. He played all over the line in college. So as you're still learning things, you would like players to have versatility. So we'll see what happens there, but at least noteworthy nonetheless that he was there. Of course, we still have a couple cuts to make on Tuesday. We have at least two. Remember, three players we now know are gone, gone Kadar Hallman, Kamal Martin, and then uh, Daniel Crawford. So potentially two more to be made unless they would claim somebody or trade for a different player or whatever. But right now they still need to make two. My guess is we saw the players that were already removed were gone from Monday's practice in Crawford, Martin, and Hallman. It wouldn't surprise me if the remaining moves were you know, injured reserve type moves, maybe to a Juwan Winfrey, maybe to a Chris Blair. Maybe they release those guys with injury designations, something like that. That would not surprise me since we already saw some cuts made. They don't necessarily have to cut anyone else. And ideally, I think they don't want to have to cut more players that they would ideally like to see play this upcoming Saturday. If Chris Blair is not going to play Saturday, if Juwan Winfrey is not going to play Saturday, you're going to have to probably release them with an injury designation anyway. So you might as well do it now prior to the, the start of the season and then work out an injury settlement later. So we'll we'll see what happens, but it would not surprise me if that's the direction that they went with. I think that covers everything. There was a lot going on, but I think those were the main things. Kamal Martin and Kadar Hallman, both gone, both recent draft picks. Again, I think Brian Gudikins deserves some credit for, for cutting bait at a time where you know these guys just weren't going to be players that were going to help their team or his team this upcoming season. And I think it was smart to make those moves. A little bit surprising that they came at this point, but if you realize that A, they weren't going to make the 53 and two, they weren't players that you were considering bringing back to the practice squad, better to make those moves now than to string it along another week. So that is going to do it for me today. Thank you as always for listening. As I mentioned earlier, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. I'll be right back here tomorrow with a brand new episode. So until next time, and as always, don't do the wave or make noise when the Packers are off on offense. And of course, go Pack Go.